This program is made possible by friends and partners of Apostle Arome Osai, Remnant Christian Network Ministry. God bless you as you join us. Jesus is saying to, is educating his disciples. And he's telling them that all things must be fulfilled, that the Bible is, is a prophetic book. And all things therein must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, which were written in the prophets, which were written in the Psalms concerning me. It means that the content of the book we call the Bible is about Jesus. Are you still there? Yes, it's about who? Jesus. So when you read the law of Moses, you can read the law of Moses, but you must hear Jesus. When you read the prophets, you can read the prophets, but you must hear who? Because they are they that speak concerning him. He is an eternal personality, and he is saying to us, that the entirety of that which was captured in the law of Moses, that which was captured in the prophets and in the Psalms were those things that were written concerning him. So he's the subject of the Bible. He's the center and the circumference. He's the extent and the limit of divine revelation. Beyond him, there is no revelation of God. He is in the centerpiece of the administration that exists in the Godhead. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh my. That's who Jesus is. It's time to rebel against the devil. When he comes to you and tells you, you are, you are a failure in ministry. You cannot amount to anything. He's telling you the opposite because he lies as his native language. Is it Satan that spoke to you that made you lose your sleep? Is it because somebody spoke to you and you took his words like the word of God? Grow up. Because where you are going in life, many imposters will come and speak in the name of God just to get you distracted. That's one of the avenues of the devil's work. But you need to come out. You know how much power is available to you. You not give up easy. We fight to see the reality of that which God has spoken. And as long as it is yet to come to pass, we will fight. And so tonight we dethrone in the congregation of the righteous. Every sort of infrastructure that have been put in place to give such a person that Satan has lifted an advantage in the outcome of the politics of Nigeria. We dethrone and depose. And we cause the edifice of strategies that have been built up to fall like a pack of cards. In the name of Jesus. By all means, reign among us. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So shall it be. Amen. You may be seated in the house of God. So while we did the teaching yesterday, some people, some of our distinguished uh, participants who are joining the meeting online, uh, we were able to glean a few questions that were registered on that chat platform. And I would like to attend to one or two before we proceed tonight. One of the questions that came uh, said thus, that can you show us an example in the scripture where Jesus collected tithes in the New Testament? Can you show us an example where Jesus connected tight in the New Testament? First of all, I would like to introduce Jesus to you because it's obvious most of us don't know Jesus in the Bible. So I need to introduce Jesus to you as he reveals himself in the Bible. Then when we have accomplished that, we will be able to answer the question. So come with me to the book of Revelation chapter 1 verse 11. Revelation Chapter 1, verse 11. Sorry. Yeah. Revelation 1, verse number 11. This is 
a personal introduction that Jesus gave about himself to John on the Isle of Patmos. So I would like us to take a look at this. And this introduction was needed because uh, the vista or the perspective from whence John viewed Jesus was somewhat defective. And that was the reason why this introduction was needed. This is Jesus speaking. If you have a red letter Bible, you will find this written in red. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Let me stop there. That's Jesus' introduction. And I don't want to trouble you with, with the Greek rendering of that scripture. Because in the original Greek, there is no and in between Alpha and Omega. But I don't, I don't want to trouble you with that. You will say I'm trying to build my personal linguistic perspective into the scripture. But if you want to be an accurate interpreter of the scripture, just in case there are theologians in our midst and you did some form of biblical studies in theological school, you will find out that the accurate interpretation of a scripture is that interpretation that is consistent with the original root words that were used in the original rendition in the first scripts. Are you there? Okay, you are not there too. Uh, you know how we do it. When I notice that you are not present in the class, we adjust the syllables to accommodate your personal hunger. When you become hungry two years later, we can review the syllables. So I will try again and see uh, to check your hunger. Are you still with me? So that's the principle of biblical interpretation that is taught in theological schools under biblical studies. It has a lot to do with the original language that was used in the primitive rendition before translation to languages like English now began. But I'm not going to trouble you with all of that perspective. Let's just take the scripture as you see it in English language. Jesus is the one introducing himself to John by himself. Whenever you see God introducing himself to an individual or to us in scripture by himself, that is what is called a testimony. A, a what? The reason why I'm defining it is because the statutes of God the laws of God, the precepts of God, and the testimonies of God are different. When we talk about the testimonies of God, what we mean is that God by himself is introducing himself by himself, not introducing himself by the agency of a prophet or a priest, but he takes the honors to make the introduction by himself. That's what happened on the Isle of Patmos. And Jesus introduced himself as what? Alpha and Omega. That is beginning and ending. And the reason for which he had to make this introduction was because John's perspective about Jesus was defective because John saw Jesus from the prism of time. He saw him as Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus had to correct that quickly so that John will be able to accommodate the fact that uh, Jesus is an eternal personality. It, it did not just begin to exist, but he is existence itself. Do you understand that? So there's a difference. And that's why Jesus had to introduce him, uh, himself to John. And if Jesus had not introduced himself to John as Alpha and, and Omega, it would have been impossible for John to fulfill his ministry at this level. Because, are you there? From previously, John used to write apostolic writings, which is to bring the accurate perspective of God about issues of conviction, issues of church life, issues of the government of God, critical issues uh, that border the people of God. But now he was moving from an apostolic writer into a prophetic writer. And the thing about prophetic writing is that it must bring the past and synchronize it with the present and also create perspective for the future. 
And that's why the instruction that John had on the Isle of Patmos was that he should write the things which he had seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. That is past, present, and future. And until you know the God called Alpha and Omega, you might not be able to do prophetic writings that will connect hallowed antiquity, existences that began even before you were formed in your mother's womb. The only basis of being able to link up with credibility to those things that happened before you were born and those things that will be after you are gone, you must be in league with someone that is eternal in scope, that did not just begin to exist, but such a person that is existence itself. Do you understand that? That was the reason for the boy stereos introduction. So John 2 verse 17 of Revelation 1. 17, quickly. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am, what? Now this guy was overwhelmed by the impact of that introduction that he fell down. I was thinking that Jesus would spare him. Jesus revived him and continued the introduction. That means he was not supposed to miss this introduction if it was going to be relevant to the agenda of God. Is that clear? Yes, and so if Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, it means Jesus did not just begin to exist in the Gospels. Jesus existed before Matthew. Is that so difficult for you to comprehend? Jesus existed before Mark. Jesus existed before Luke. Jesus existed before John. I'm still telling you about Jesus. I'd like us to turn to the book of uh, Luke chapter 24, beginning from verse number 44. Luke 24, 44. This is still Jesus speaking. If your Bible is a red letter Bible, you will find these words in red. It means you cannot edit them. You cannot manipulate them. They are direct words from God. And he said unto them, these are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Let's, let's try it again. Jesus is saying to, is educating his disciples. And he's telling them that all things must be fulfilled, that the Bible is, is a prophetic book. And all things therein must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, which were written in the prophets, which were written in the Psalms concerning me. It means that the content of the book we call the Bible is about Jesus. Are you still there? It's about who? So when you read the law of Moses, you can read the law of Moses, but you must hear Jesus. When you read the prophets, you can read the prophets, but you must hear who? Because they are they that speak concerning him. He is an eternal personality, and he is saying to us that the entirety of that which was captured in the law of Moses, that which was captured in the prophets and in the Psalms were those things that were written concerning him. So he's the subject of the Bible. He's the center and the circumference. He's the extent and the limit of divine revelation. Beyond him, there is no revelation of God. He is in the centerpiece of the administration that exists in the Godhead. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh my. That's who Jesus is. So now that you have seen that Jesus is an eternal personality and he disabused John's perspective of him which was revelation that was factored into time, Jesus of Nazareth. Now that you have also seen that the content of the entire Bible, I hope, okay, are you still there with me? Okay. Uh, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. 
What is that? What's the meaning of that? That's the Old Testament. And the Old Testament was the Bible that was there when Jesus was in his earthly ministry. The Old Testament was the Bible that was there when Paul fulfilled his earthly ministry. <laughs> it will surprise you to know that it, it, it was 136 years after the first apostles that the document that we call the New Testament was added to the scriptures as the fulfillment of the testament that was enacted by the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. So the Bible Paul walked with was say what we call the Old Testament. Are you there? You're not there? Okay. I, I, somebody's challenging me in the congregation. So let me respond to that person's thought. Because the person said, okay, now that we have the New Testament, can you also confirm that in the New Testament, the subject of the New Testament is about Christ? We now know that that's the subject of the Old Testament. That's what the person is saying. Uh, can you come with me quickly, quickly, to the book of uh, Acts of the Apostles, uh, chapter 8. Are you doing Acts of the Apostles? Who is there with me? All right, so can we start our reading from this? Chapter 8, verse 4, Acts 8, 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ. Underline Christ. What did he preach? Christ. I don't have time to, to do that work. Philip preached what? If we check, there were only a few times in scripture where people's message were summarized. Only a few times in the New Testament, you'll find a summary of a man's message. And even the first New Testament delivery, which was what took place on the day of Pentecost, when Peter began his presentation, and that's a message that theologians will call inconsistent with um, <laughs> the principles of <laughs> hermeneutics. All right? But you see, if you look at that message, he was talking to a very diverse audience, people from different nations. And he had, a, he had to establish a context that was central to the interest of all the participants that were present there that day. So he said a lot of stuff, historical stuff, prophetic stuff. He quoted a few scriptures broad perspective from different angles, which we may not need to do tonight because that's not the subject. But you see, in his final presentation, which was the conclusion of his message, what he did was that he presented Jesus. He said, this Jesus, that was where his evangelical delivery began. The presentation of a personality called what? So by the time you come to the book of Acts chapter 8, you will now see in bold summary, what Philip preached in Samaria. The Bible says he preached what? Preached Christ unto them. If we continue, you will now see that the sum total of the New Testament is about Christ and his kingdom. So this book that we have is about the revelation of a person. And our faith in the New Testament is faith in a person. Don't ever forget that. Faith in what? A person. It's a revelation of a person so that we can have faith in a person. Is that clear? All right. So let me drop it there. In view of the above, therefore, 
The scripture that we read in the book of Genesis chapter 14 as touching Melchizedek that received tithes from Abraham. I want, you to, I want to show you that that was Jesus. Just in case the person that asked the question is still online, I'm taking this pain to bring perspective so that you will see that the Bible is not capable of contradiction and the Bible also is not capable of private interpretation. The reason is because there is one author and many writers. So the principle of witness finds expression. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, every issue of contention can be cancelled out and established. Are you there? Because of the way in which the scriptures came to us through one spirit and through the ministry of many writers, making it impossible for private interpretation because anything that you claim to be the mind of God must satisfy the requirement of witness. Two or three people in different locations, different spokesmen for God in their generation must have made reference to that thought that you believe that God is forwarding. If that is not the case, then we cannot accept that that, your conclusion, is in keeping with the thoughts of God. Are you still here with me? You see, we need to be biblically accurate before we can be spiritually accurate. Lest someone will claim that the Holy Spirit has spoken and uh, there will be no scripture to back him up. Are you there? You are not there. No matter how powerful your prophetic ministry is, the logos, the written word, will be used to check your ministry. But your ministry doesn't have enough authority to check the word of God. So we, we will fall back to the word of God as our frame of reference, as the basis upon which we can judge everything that God is doing. Are you there? So come with me quickly. Let me make a final claim. Uh, because preaching the Bible sometimes is like going to court. You need to present strong reasons. Very strong reasons. That's how truth was established those days. There were debates. People came with philosophies, different philosophies, trying to build it into scripture. And because the debates were public, you will know where the pendulum of the mind of God is when people begin to argue with scripture as proof. That's how it was those days. And that's why it was difficult for you to peddle error. In the next publication in the newspaper, your name will be there, the error you postulated and how it is wrong. And you will go into hiding. But because we don't have those debates again, there's no platform where we can hear the errors that people are preaching and merge them, contend with scripture. But the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Come with me quickly to the book of Hebrews. That's where Apostle Paul took time to um, bring perspective about the personality Mel Chizadek. Hebrews chapter 7. Please, you may wish to display it on the screen. I will read from verse 1 to 3, then jump and read from verse 15 to 17. Is it for this Mel Chizadek? Here is title. These are his titles. Number one, he is a, the king of Salem. What is Salem? King of Salem. I hope you know. Are you there? Salem means peace. Have you heard of Prince of Peace before? Oh, you have not heard of it. All right. Is priest of the most, most high God. It was Paul, when he went to Arabia, that gave us perspective about the heavenly ministry of Christ. When he came back from Arabia, he had had encounters with God that he had no utterance to communicate. If my calculations are correct, some of the encounters that he had, he, he had to tarry for 17 years in order for God to give him utterance to communicate some of the things that he stumbled upon in Arabia. Are you there? One of the revelations he encountered in his honeymoon in Arabia was about the heavenly ministry of Christ. Are you there? 
Then he was the one that revealed, Paul was the one that revealed that there were three dimensions to his priesthood in the heavenlies. That he was a divine priest. He was a kingly king priest and he was a heavenly priest. And all of these are picked from the book of Ephesians. That Jesus is a divine priest. And the reason why he's a divine priest is because his priesthood is predicated on the life that he has. His life is endless. It's on the strength of his endless life that he functions in that priesthood. He is a king priest. In fact, that's where Apostle Paul coined the fact that we are a royal priesthood after the order of the priest that oversees our affairs. Are you with me? This structure of priesthood is a departure from the Levitical order. Because, are you, are you here? You are not here, so I'll, I'll, I'll just leave you. So there were three dimensions to his priesthood in the heavenlies. And the Bible calls him the priest of the Most High God, whom Abraham met returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness and after that also king of peace. Verse 3. Without father, without mother, without descent. I hope you are seeing Alpha and Omega there. It doesn't have an origin. It doesn't de derive from a genealogy of a, or a family tree. When we follow the description you find of this personality, okay, jump to verse 15 as I round up so that I don't take all the time. Verse 15 to 17. And it was yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest, yeah, after the order of the priesthood of Melchizedek, who is made not after the law of canal commandment, but after the power of an endless life, 17, for he testified, thou art the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So it is in the spirit. Are you there? I hope you know when we say a governor, the... Governorship is an office. Just like local government chairman. Chairmanship is an office that is occupied by a human being. So, this priesthood after the order of Melchizedek is an office that it happens to be that Jesus is the one occupying that office. So it was the office of that priest after the order of Melchizedek that came to receive tithes. From, it is part of the duties of that office to receive tithes. And the scripture is saying here in the New Testament that tithes were received through that office from Abraham. So if that person online is asking, show me a scripture where Jesus received tithes. Based on this my explanation, we can show you plenty of scriptures. Because this one we are talking about is without father, it's without mother. So we can trace anywhere the office of Melchizedek appears in any part of the Bible. Are you there? Just like if the office of the governor gave you a contract, even if that governor changes, the office is still there. But the thing about the office of this priest is that he's the only one, the, the, the office is synonymous to him because no one else will ever earn that capacity. So every time that office manifested, it was him that manifested through that office. And everything he did in the capacity of that office, it was him and him only that operated in that regard. 
I hope I have answered the person's question. So I have a notice here for all those who are online participating. We want to spread the word that the scriptures are being taught. So you have the responsibility to help me bring other people into the room. Part of the things you can do is to click the subscribe button on both the YouTube and the Facebook channel. Secondly, like the video that you are watching currently. Tenderly, ensure that you share this live service link to as many people as possible. Friends, family, and enemies. And the Lord will bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. Second question before I jump into my teaching. He said, Elkanah and his household went up to offer to God the yearly sacrifice and vow. What is this sacrifice? For example, is it a whole month's salary for one who is fully employed? So this person is taking me to practicality, how to practicalize the lecture. Uh, but first of all, I need to tell you something. Uh, I need to take you to the book of Hebrews chapter 11 so that we can talk in scripture. In Hebrews chapter 11, what we call, are you there? There were several examples of our ancestors that operated by faith. Several examples of our ancestors that operated by faith. The first ancestor of ours that is mentioned here is in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4. Hebrews 11 verse 4, the Bible says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. So when we study this, our ancestor, you will see that the motivation, the capacity, the ability by which he was able to give unto God the way he did was the capacity or the instrumentality of faith. So your giving is an illustration of your faith. If we force you to give much more than it is reflected by the faith capacity that you have, we have, uh, we have moved you out of faith. Giving is something that you grow in. All right? It's not something that is imposed upon you or you are cajoled to do. Every time in Scripture that the emphasis was given, you will hear God say something like, I love a cheerful giver. All right? So giving is an expression of your faith. So what someone might call sacrifice Another person might call it child's play because he has grown in faith and that is no longer a sacrifice to him. So when we say sacrifice, it is relative. Are you there? There is no flat formula anywhere in practicality that puts us in the same category because we'll never be in the same category in our dealings with God. Our category is based on the capacity of our faith. You stay with me. Yes, the thing about the first fruits is that it must be a sacrifice. And what a sacrifice is to you is dependent on your faith because it was only by faith that Abel was able to offer a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Is that clear? Also, when we speak about Jesus... It will be needful for you to understand that the scriptures document the fact that Jesus did not offer himself 
as a sacrifice by himself. Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice through the Holy Spirit. It means there was spirit energy. There was spirit prompting. There was spirit blessing. There was spirit capacity that was at work when Jesus offered himself. And that's the kind of thing that happens when you receive the, spirit, the gift of faith to make a sacrifice. So it is relative to our various measures. Of faith. I just went for a preaching engagement and I was given honor honorarium. And the amount is it's about the highest I've ever received as a minister. Hallelujah. But you know what? It's a first fruit. The, the number of zeros, irrespective. That is the way of spiritual men. If you are going to begin a spiritual year, you start it with first foot. And just in case you are in the midst of a pit and you are trusting that God will bring you out of that pit before the end of 12 months, you add another spice to your first fruit to make it more effective. And that spice is a vow. Whereas you will give your first fruit, then you make a vow Depending when you are out of the pit. Do you understand that strategy? These are the principles by which our ancestors of old moved the hand of God. And just in case you have not been seeing God in your space, it's not because God is not as powerful as you read about him in the scriptures. It is just that we have... <laughs> a generation has come that doesn't know the ways of God anymore and we don't know how to move the hand of God. Is that clear? Hallelujah. So I'm going to stop there now and go back to my lecture for the day. So as we get more questions, I'll treat two before I lecture. And then during the weekends, it will be just question and answer all through. And then we'll tackle all the loose ends so that the full idea of how to practice the things that we are talking about will be playing. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. Okay. Yesterday we spoke about the first fruit and we said it has two meanings in the Bible, two definitions in the Bible. The first one is the annual one which we saw and is the basis upon which every spiritual man starts his spiritual year. It starts with a commitment to God an offering to God that is a sacrifice and the statement or the intercession or the plea that goes as an accompaniment with this sacrifice is to put the Lord on notice that the months that are ahead of you, you seek his intervention to make the most of it. That's how to put God on the spot. And in the day of trouble, when you cry to him, he will show up because there is a contract, there is a transaction that you had with him in the privacy of your, of your closing. All right, the second one, the second thought on the issue of first fruits is captured in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse number 9. Proverbs, chapter 3, verse number 9. He said, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all thine increase. In the second definition of first fruits, you will see it always associated with the word increase. Increase. All right, so maybe you are on a salary of... Um, 20,000, and then at some point you were promoted, and then your new salary is 25,000. That means you increased. What is the increase there? 5,000. That increase, the first time you experience that increase, it belongs to God. So the increased dimension only comes when there is increase. You might remain on 25,000 for two years. You are not, there's no increase. Is that clear? 
Then when you are moved again to 30,000, then there is increase. That first increase belongs to God. Then sub subsequently you tight inclusive of that increase. Is that clear? I hope that's not, there's no ambiguity on that matter. So the second definition of first fruits is inclusive of the word what? Increase. Increase. And I actually have a friend that is increase. He's watching me now. He's, he's, his name is Increase. Amen. So we are finished with first fruits. You know, the things we are talking about are the are cursed things. Are you there? So we have seen one. One is the tithe. The second one is the first fruit. And if you are going to accomplish worship, you accomplish it with the accursed things, with things that belong to God, things that are due to God. Is that clear? Uh -huh. That's how you accomplish worship. Worship is not just that you came to church. You might have come to church and you did not accomplish worship because you did not give God that which is due him. Whenever you are practicing worship, you are giving to God that which is his due. Okay. Are we there? Let's go to another item uh, that is a dedicated matter that is one of the things that is due to God. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15. Hebrews 13 verse 15. It says, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, what exactly is the sacrifice of praise? Then he defines it. He calls it the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Part of the things that is due God is the fruit of our lips. So if we call it first fruit, then the first thing you must do when you wake up in the morning is to give thanks to God. And it's a religious practice that you must sustain on a daily basis to old age. I don't know how many of you are aware of the things that fly in the night. David gave us a little insight into the nature of the night. Are you aware of what happens in the night? Okay. Let me give you, oh, no need, you know, you know what happens in the night. Oh, just in case there are people that don't know, um, oh, technical people, can you help us with David's perspective of the night? He speaks about the pestilence, the arrows that fly by day and what? That's Psalms 92? 91. Okay, let's go to Psalms 91 and see the things that happen in the night. You owe God the fruit of your lips is part of the things that are devoted things. It is God's due. So if, if the fruit of your lips, if it is a fruit, then the first fruit which is the first utterance you make every day, vocal utterance, should be utterances of thanksgiving. It says, surely he shall, verse 5, okay, just jump to verse 5. It said, thou shalt not be afraid of the terror, <laughs> the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flyeth by day. Verse 6, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness. These are things superior to your intelligence that are at work synonymous with your inhaling and exhaling during the night time. We have many medical personnel in this auditorium. And if they are truthful to us, that we know that every act of healing that takes place through drugs is a miracle. Doctor, can you say that? <laughs> we have a very senior doctor in the midst. I don't know why he likes sitting in the congregation. He handed over to my father in the Lord in medical school, the fellowship in medical school. <laughs> he, he is in our midst. Can we 
Fabi Salodri. <laughs> Hallelujah. So he handed over to my father in the Lord uh, as coordinator of their fellowship. What, what year was that? 19, 1980. Now, <laughs> all right, all right. When you see people healing, recovering from infirmity, recovering from sickness, it's not so much of the drugs. Hallelujah. So I've seen this on a lot, uh, many hospital signboards. We treat. God heals. <laughs> so, okay, some, some are we care, but God heals. Hallelujah. There is a pestilence that walketh in darkness. So it's expected that when, when you survive the night and you see the break of another day, the first thing you do is that you offer unto him the fruit of your lips. The first fruits belong to God. The first talking. Meanwhile, you can have people wake up from sleep and continue the quarrel that they started last night. There's no sense of reverence. No sense of thanksgiving. There's no understanding of the fact that you escaped pestilence. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. So that is one of the things that are due to God. The fruit up your lips and the first utterances that you make every morning should be utterances of thanksgiving. This is how he puts it in the book of Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15. By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Number four, your body is one of the dedicated things. And the way you use your body will determine if God will be favorably disposed to you or not. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning from verse 15 to verse 20. 1 Corinthians 6, beginning from verse 15 to verse 20. It said, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? What's the answer to that question? God forbid. Say what? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, said he, shall be one flesh. Do you know the meaning of this scripture? Oh, you are not, you are not following me. Uh, wait, don't remove that scripture. I said, do you know the meaning of that scripture? Do you realize that what Paul is saying is every act of sex is an act of marriage? Whether you like it or not, there is some form of union has been achieved by that act. And there are a lot of potentials that that act can give to the kingdom of darkness if that union is illegal. A gradient is created where there can be transmission of demonic things just because one is joined to a harlot. Nothing makes you more vulnerable than joining your body to that which you don't have the blessing of God so to join. As we study, you will find out that this your body belongs to God. It is God's temple and the only person that has jurisdiction, jurisdiction to access it is someone that God has endorsed, which happens to be your wife. Only your wife can, God has ceded that body that is his to your wife. So your wife can have the body. And when your wife has the body, it is in keeping with the will of God. Are you there? But when you join it illegally, Nothing makes you more vulnerable than this kind of activity. The reason is because your body is one of the things that is due to God. It's a dedicated thing. 
It belongs to God. It does not belong to you. Yeah, go on. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that man doeth is without the body, but he that committed fornication sinned against his own body. This is what makes us normally say that every sin is not the same. Because the Bible puts this particular sin in a separate category, it calls it a sin against the body. Exactly. And nothing diffuses the concentration of the grace of God on your life as much as fornication. No matter how powerful the car you are riding is, if you have a flat tire, that car will be jacked. It will be mobilized. Not because it has engine problem. The engine is still intact. But you are going to have motion problem. So you will need to stop it and jack the car. Remove the tire and treat it. Anyone that becomes a slave of fornication must be immobilized. If his place of mobility is the pulpit, he must be quarantined from pulpit because the tire has to be jacked and treated. Are you with me? He, is, he has deflated. If he keeps running on the wheels, he'll be running on, on uh, what do they call that thing? Rooms. The other day, we were escaping one danger. There was a problem with the tire, but we had to escape a danger. And we ran on the rims. That's the day I discovered that rims can break. Rims. Alloy rims broke. We got to safety, but... Uh, we lost the rims. No matter how, and I was on the bends. We say how to jack it, and to so when you are on the pulpit and you are overtaken by the flood of fornication, flood of immorality, the best thing that can happen to you is that help comes to you. The best what you need is help, not a microphone. They will have to jack the system and deposit you in the intensive care unit of the grace of God so that Master Jesus can come and apply drip. The drip of the washing of water by his wall. Aye. So that your veins and the bloodstream can be purged. When you come out of that clinic, you are supposed to be coming out in the full regalia of a humble man. <laughs> because that's the only way you can escape that epidemic. It's not your portion in the name of Jesus. <laughs> it is not your portion. Your body is one of those things that belong to God. In fact, he said that if you decide to defy that body that you are carrying, which is his property, he will destroy you. Not Satan, no. He said he will destroy you. Are you there? We look at two other matters on spiritual covering. So we have finished the issues of the accursed things, the dedicated things. Uh, so let us do two other principles as I try to round up for the night. You can also access spiritual covering through the grace that is operational in the life of an active minister that is in active service to Jesus. Turn your Bible to the book of Acts chapter 20 verse 29. Acts chapter 20 verse 29. For I know this that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you not sparing the flock. These grievous wolves could not enter in among the people as long as Apostle Paul was present. Do you realize that? The presence of Apostle Paul created covering for the people and the wolves had to stay at bay. And they were hoping for a time and such a time 
as Apostle Paul will depart from the locality, then they will have an opportunity to make their comeback. The thing about someone that has a commission from God, that has an assignment from God, especially someone that is in active service, seeing to it that the um, actualization of that, that assignment is in force, the thing about such a person is that he has access to the grace that establishes a, com a commission. The grace that establishes a commission is corporate grace. Even though it is on one man, it is not meant for that man. The man is not functioning according to the believer's measure of grace, but is functioning according to the grace that establishes the allotment that God has sent him to. Are you there? You are not there. Okay. Let me give you an example. Pastor Tony. Pastor Tony, I used to know you as an, he was an accounting student. Those days, he used to wear a black trouser and a navy blue shirt. You were in, what level were you when I was in final year? I got to BSU 2000, and I got admission 2003, November 15th. 2000, no. Did you meet me? I'm not sure. We didn't meet. No, we didn't meet. <laughs> sit down, sit down. Why did you accept? <laughs> we didn't meet, we didn't meet. I, I think Gabi Toto, Gabi Toto is the first human being that came to me and said he wants to stop me to get this Gabi Toto. So take the microphone. Because we want to hear from him. Don't lie today, don't lie, don't lie. Say the truth. First of all, why did you come? Come, come here, come here. This is the first human being that ever came to me and said, I have seen. <laughs> so, please, why did you come to me that day? What motivated you? Because those days, I don't used to laugh much. Why, how did you survive and please talk to the world, yeah? I just came on campus and... What year was it? 2000. 2000. Then you were the coordinator of BSU Encounter Crusade. BSU Encounter Crusade. All right, so the pioneer of BSU Encounter Crusade is, is even here. The one that started that crusade, that handed over to me. So he's here. All right? You know why I'm doing this? If I, we can't trace you to a man, we'll trace you to the devil. May the Lord give you understanding. All right, go on. So in my evangelistic outreaches on campus, I investigated to find out the fathers that were on the campus before I came who had labored, and I found out he was one of them, so I went to him and submitted to him and submitted the entire ministry that the Lord gave me the honor of starting then BSU Watchers under him as a spiritual covering. So he became one of the persons that God used to establish the campus on the land. So I saw in you one who could father young people and who had a heart for young people. And that's why I came to submit. Okay. Um, what did you get? Did you gain anything at all? <laughs> yes, you, you, you told a little of the story here last year. When you, when you were leaving campus, that lady that attempted ah! to... Yes. There was a lady. <laughs> <laughs> May the Lord deliver all young men. <laughs> this lady, if you touch that lady, no anointing will come on your head again. You will be bored in the spirit. So when I was leaving, I called him. I said, this lady, as you labor here, make sure no, your chest is not stained by her. Did you survive that lady? I did. Okay. She, she actually made a lot of attempts. <laughs> she made the attempts. I pretended, like, I pretended like I was not aware that I had intelligence about her. Pretended like I was, I was playing along. Listen to me. I was not even close to being the best. Most of the best came down through that lady. May the Lord give you understanding. So I think I received the original documents on how to survive sexual sin from you. Mm. 
So here is Gabe Bitodo. He's, he's an arrowhead to watch in the days to come. He has been thoroughly discipled. You will see that in his discipline, the way he has ordered himself, his family life, the way he treats his wife, the way... The reason is because he was discipled. He had an authority around him that would say, this cannot happen. And he was foolish enough to submit to it. God has a great treasure at work in his life. I salute you. Now listen, there are grievous wolves that stand guard waiting for opportunities to prey on the destiny of the unsuspecting. But the presence of apostolic covering is the antidote of the kingdom to that level of invasion. I don't want to go beyond that. If I give another example now, you will. So I, I want to stop there. Are you there? All right, so we'll do the popular scriptures, Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. You all know this scripture? Hallelujah. Are you there in Second Chronicles 20, 20? And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. It is possible for you to have found the secure place. The secure place is your relationship with God. The secure place are the things that happen to you when you encounter God. One of the things that encounters you, one of the things that happens to you, is that you have personal conviction about God's commitment to your life, God's commitment to your destiny. And I said here before that if you lose in your soul, you will lose on the ground. There's no need to fight. There's already a hole in your armor. When we go into the armor of God, you will see the way Satan defeats people even before the fight. If you lose, help me preach to your neighbor quickly. Tell him, if you lose in your soul, you have lost on the ground. So in your secure place, one of the things that God does is that he comes to um, administer a certain kind of currency, the currency of assurance, the currency of conviction. This currency are the utensils God gives you to stabilize your soul. Your soul is versatile and your soul is unreliable. But when the Holy Spirit administers conviction, this conviction can run so deep that it can steal your soul just like an anchor will steal a mighty ship. When you are in alignment like that and your spirit and your soul are in alignment, even when you see things that are contrary to the things that God has told you, you will have enough impetus to believe beyond the situation that what is at work in your spirit is so solid that this fickle circumstance cannot override it. That's how faith and the life of faith is born. Are you still with me? I say, are you here? So we understand the blessing and the stability that comes when a man has found God in his secure place. And there's a temptation to think that your secure place is an indication of the fact that you don't need any other person. There are various support systems that God puts in place to ensure that you don't miss your way. Apart from the robustness of conviction that comes because of your intercourse with God, there are also several infrastructure built into the body of Christ in the likeness and in the form of men that have touched the Lord and uh, God can trust them with some substances of grace. You also need that external support system in order to guarantee your establishment in that which God has sent you to perform. So you might have a robust, secure place. And just in case you don't have the prophet, 
Are you there? You can have a vision. Okay, say, I want to marry this lady. That was how someone came the other time. I said, he came and said, in the night vision, I beheld this damsel high into the heavens. I told him, go and sit down. Because, hallelujah. And he trusted me, went and sat down. And he didn't even ask me why I told him to go and sit down. He didn't ask me. The reason was because he believed in my leadership. He went and sat down. And he sat down for two years. After two years, I now called him and said, that one day, go and check. Go to your place. That's your place of prayer. Go there and check this one. He came after three weeks smiling. I said, that's the way. He never asked me why I told him to go and sit down. This is someone that has encounters when he prays. He has a robust, secure place. But his secure place did not, did not, did not exempt him from the need of a prophet. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall he be established. Meanwhile, someone had come to me. I told, I told the person, don't go there. The person came after two weeks and said, God said he has settled me. Why am I disturbing him? I said, in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you are blessed and released to go. Hallelujah. And Satan struck. You know why? There is a grace that God puts, a grace that God releases to establish a commission. It's different from the grace that is upon your life. And I don't doubt your accuracy in the spirit. But one thing about the prophetic is that we need to confirm it. We need to cross-check. We need to compare notes. The prophetic can be judged. Because Satan too can quote scriptures. If you have read your Bible, the closest relative to prophecy is soothsaying. That's what a spirit of divination does. I hear people clap when people call phone numbers. I say, your phone number is 0806. Do you know that someone with the spirit of divination can call your phone number? Can call your name? The name of your compound? The name of your village? What's the difference between a soothsayer and a prophet? The prophet has the capacity to reveal the things of God. Your name is not a, one of the things of God. Your phone number is not one of the things of God. The name of your village. They make me. Is it God that gave that name? Is it God? What's the meaning of the they make me? Eh? Let me die. Is it God that? <laughs> May the Lord give you understanding. Those are not the things of God. It can be revealed by divination. The Bible says we have received a spirit which is not of this world, but the spirit which is of God, that we may know the things that are freely given to us of God with things we speak not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but in words which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Are you there? Believe in the Lord your God. So shall he be established. Believe also in his prophets. So shall he prosper. I had an invitation last year by a nation. A nation invited me. Not, 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 not a conference, not a church. Do you understand that? A nation invited me, sent me invitation, an invitation. So I had that opportunity, that privilege. And they paid for my, for my ticket, business class, sent me visas and everything. 
I had to call my father in the Lord because I've never seen this type, this aspect of ministry before. What I know ministry to be is that they, uh, they invite you for a conference uh, somewhere and then you go for that conference. All right? For the first time in my life, a nation invited me. So I called my father in the Lord. And in my own opinion, because of the way I was discipled, I was not inclined to go in. Because I felt, what, what was I going to do? Was I was going to show myself. So I felt there was no deal. So I, but I called him. I said, I've never seen this kind of thing before. A nation invited me. He said, ah, that's the greatest honor of a preacher. Go, and when you come back, tell me what happened. Even though I didn't feel like going, the prophet, huh? that's the one Baba said I should follow. He said, go. So my own personal inclination about it had expired because of... Believe, is it that I can't hear God? Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe also in his prophets. So shall you prosper. Please, may the Lord help you to understand that I'm not using this scripture to sell myself to you. No. I just teach the scriptures the way it is without adding my own personal desires so that everybody can see the simplicity of the word of God and profit from the counsel of our God. Hallelujah. If I am not mistaken, I am seeing one of my class. Is that Idris? This guy was not a Christian those days. Idris, stand up, stand up, stand up. Maybe one of these days, that, that's Idris, my classmate in secondary school. <laughs> you don't know the miracle that has taken place. This man, those days, was one of the most radical Muslims. This man. So Idris is in church today. <laughs> we are going to pray tonight. We want to gather all the grace that is in this hall together in one place and throw it over Nigeria. So that the utterances of which doctors, satanic intercessors that have been contracted over the years to ensure that we journey the path of another exodus into deeper darkness will be truncated. I sense the hand of God tonight. We want to gather all the grace, the one on your life, the one on my life, and make a weapon out of the collocation of the grace of God that is in this place today. And by it, oh my, we want to stop the enemy that wants to take us on another ride in darkness. Somebody raise your voice tonight. We have come of age. It is up to us to contend for the liberty of our land. So we come together as one man with one voice. And what we decree tonight is that Nigeria must be free. May the heavens hear your voice. May the grace of God that is at work among us tonight arise like a weapon in the spirit. Oh my God. Oh, see a kelo man telly. Sufres katabonde mamalahasi. Ebromena si a konde bahi katala. Roske to benja izo zele ebreska falema onde ma. No more shall we languish under the yoke of oppression. It's our time to step into liberty. We make mention of the power of God, of the glory of God over Nigeria. Lord, let your jealousy be provoked. Oh, 
Prashikete, prashi shakelo monde. Ila mo koratia salabonde la. Yeko se komba la kuse la aite. Meresko tele. Alanto si kopraski to bala batala. Anta ya kopeleke. Asubri ala baboke tamina. Alaito sante. Yata kopala ata. Ala baba si koma hai. Rai! Ela la bon sama. Raski sa sete. Brako mena ila basi atando. We will no longer walk in darkness. So we call upon your name tonight that you might stretch your hands over Nigeria. Take out of the way that which has become an obstacle to the fulfillment of your plan. Let grace, let grace be administered let grace be released. Let grace be released. Hey! Kabo siya mahaya anta babosa kole bahata iata babosa minakadia raka bababa santoria selita iaka la dada babosa adratala. Eka mata la babon jamena tese Alla bosamena Raita kombe sa abo Reka babasuke bantana Akabe sobre ketala Aratemos Lekateliamos Antemamos Rakatala babon telia Jamina kaya tobe kanteli Atrabasuke bakatua Abrasata babo dekena babo God, we seek your intervention. We seek your intervention that you will arise suddenly. Let your enemies be scattered. Kalibo seti alab, raskanteli, raskanteli, priata baboko taminakata. Oh. Forever your name is ever great. You are the wisdom before time began. You reign forever, your name is ever great. You are the wisdom before time began. The wisdom before time began. You reign forever, your name is ever great. You are the wisdom before time began. Take the hand of somebody near you. During the course of this year, the Lord will be your covering. The righteous one is therein, and I say, Never again shall we be drawn into captivity. Never again. Never again. Never again. Never again. In the name of Jesus. The Bible speaks about the security system that was used to imprison Peter. He calls it four quaternions of soldiers. 
It means there are four sets of four. So when you break through the first one, you, you, are, you are thinking that you will escape, then you are bound by the second one. When you break through the second one and you want to take off, then you are bound by the third one. When you break through the third one and, and you are about to take off, then you are bound by the fourth one. At that time, your morale is broken. It, it seems the kind of web that Nigeria has been built into is their quaternions. So that you are surviving, you survive one and you are about to take in fresh air. Then it's mucus that is available. Black exhaust air. The Bible said that affliction shall not arise again the second time. He took an angel from the presence of God to discomfit the wisdom behind that security system. When the man was stabbed to wake up, his intention was to run out naked. The angel said, Kai, this is not a rescue strategy. Say, put on your clothes, put on. <laughs> he said, there is majesty in this rescue. There's majesty in it. Don't be in a hurry. You have time. Oh, you are forgetting socks there. Put on the socks. Put on. The man was wondering, what kind of escape happens with majesty? The chains fell of their own accord. He was coming out of the prison yard. He saw the security systems that no man could defy. And the Bible revealed that when he came to the iron gate of the city, it opened of his own accord. <laughs> Sometimes in order for God to bring deliverance, men need to die. Even the high priest said, is it not better for a man to die than for a whole nation? The high priest. <laughs> so we want to say tonight, oh God, arise, oh God, arise, oh God, arise, and let your enemies be scattered. Can you see my so to come Let your enemies be scattered. Oh. Send an angel. Send Michael. Send cherubims of glory by all means. Let the iron gate of Nigeria open of his own. We give you praise. Yes. We are coming out of that system of bondage that have been carefully crafted to keep us in perpetual captivity. The Lord will send help for Nigeria. Oh my God. 
We are coming out. It has been carefully crafted to keep us bent over for a long time. But Jehovah comes to set us at liberty. Thank you, Father. So we stand with one voice as one man to make proclamations tonight. That affliction shall not arise again the second time. We have learned our lessons. And we have sought diligently your face in intercession, pleading for mercy. We are fully persuaded that you are appeased already. So we ask of you, thou shall arise and have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her. The set time is come. Anything you need to do to break us out of this jail, make it happen. That thy people may rejoice in thee. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for a moment. Let the offering baskets go round. Those of you that are participating online, you will find the details uh, that you can use to cast your offering on the screen. We will not get tired of praying for Nigeria. This is our moment of liberty and we are going to trust that the hand of God will be moved on our behalf to ensure that affliction does not arise again the second time. Uh, be encouraged as we continue in the prayer marathon. To know more about Apostle Aroma Osai and his ministry, Remnant Christian Network, kindly visit at rcnglobal.org and follow us on social media platforms, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram at Apostle Aroma Osai or call plus 234 God bless you.